Next stop, Chicago Junction. Ah, uh, welcome to another run to Chicago Junction. Designed for your journey to the amazing world of trains. Both real and in model form. I'm your announcer, Brian Ballou, and here is our boss, the head of the Mundi City Hometown Entertainment Network, Mr. John DeVita. Well, thank you very much, Brian, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Chicago Junction from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network. And today is Wednesday, March the 13th. <coughs> the year 2024. Today the panel will be talking about railroads and model railroads. And now, to start today's program, here's our announcer, Mr. Brian. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, I am uh, a rail enthusiast. I'm an uh, ex-railroader, engineer conductor. Um, the one uh, thing that I do really stay with right now is I do presentations for Operation Lifesaver. Uh, trying, trying to make it safe out there for all them kitties. And some w well-meaning adults. So you tell them don't put their ears on the track to listen for the train, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, we do, we do not play cowboys and Indians around the rails. Uh, I am an O-gager. I also do outdoor railroading with G-scale. Um, I've got interesting pieces in HO gauge. <laughs> and, uh, yes, I belong to a few also museums. Um, while a life member to the Pacific Southwest Railway Museum in San Diego, California, Campo, and member of the Heston Steam Museum, member of the Red, the Reading Technical and Historical Society uh, for the Reading Company uh, Railroad, and that's about it. I think that's enough for now. <clears throat> Hi, this is Doug Kenyuk. I'm a longtime rail fan. Uh, I have N scale at home, and uh, I I just do rail fanning stuff. I run a couple of websites. I'm an officer in the Railroad and Short Lines Club of Chicago. Uh, third Fridays of every month, except in the summer, we meet at Union Station, so it's real easy to get to. Just take a metro train. And uh, I also, on the side, I teach programming, computer technology, at the local college. And we talk about railroads. Railroads are a lot of fun, as far as I'm concerned. If it runs on rails, I'm interested, basically. That includes maglevs, as I was watching a video about how that's not doing too well. It's just a, the reason it doesn't do so well. It's a great idea. However, it's terribly expensive to build right now. So unless they come up with something better, we're not going to see very There's only 13 systems in the whole world running right now. And what, uh, three of them are in Disneyland, aren't they? No, there are three are in China. Ah. And they're only for short distances. They're not for long distance because they're just terribly expensive. They're more like, oh, look what I got type uh, railroad. <laughs> 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 then I was looking at watching a video about high-speed rail and I don't know what this numbnut was thinking, but he goes, well, let's suppose we build a high-speed rail from New York to L.A. How much would it cost? Oh, I think it's going to cost like $4 trillion to build. And that's before the court cases start coming in. <laughs> well, you, I mean, I don't I, – obviously, this guy does not understand railroad technology because the way he was describing this stuff is like, do you even understand? Do you, you listen to yourself for five minutes? But, uh, yeah, there's some interesting videos out there about railroads and stuff. I watch occasion, see mm -hmm. what's going on. And uh, so, you know, right, right now Metro's going to get those DMUs 
battery DMUs. Where are they going to run them? Are they going to run them on the Rock Island line or the Burlington line or maybe they're going to put them on the Heritage line, free up some equipment for the other guys? I mean, I well, I remember, you know, and this is not the first time they had DMUs. Remember the Fiat cars? Where did they run them? Rock Island. Didn't see them anyplace else. Oh, and then he had the ones from Israel they ran, too. Those ran on the Milwaukee North Line. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I thought they were running for Amtrak. May, I don't know. I just remember seeing them on the Milwaukee North Line. Never yeah. got a picture because I couldn't figure out when they were running. Maybe it was Amtrak. Yeah, it was Amtrak. I saw them, uh, They were, and they were trying them out on the uh, Hiawatha Line. Okay. Well, uh, just for everybody to know, a DMU is diesel multiple unit. Basically, it looks like a subway. Good old RDCs. Yes. Yeah, we're going back in time. <laughs> so anyway, you want to start or you want me to start? You can start. Okay. Got a bunch of interesting things. Not much. Been a quiet month for a change. Except on the STB, they're still flooding the thing with uh, rate reports and traffic reports and status reports. Uh, it's just like a flood of them out there every week. Okay. A place called Innovative Rail Technologies has been selected to provide its Ath Atlas lithium-ion battery electric propulsion system for a Dominion Energy-led project funded by the Texas Military Preparedness Commission to improve energy resilience for rail operations at Fort Calvazazo, Texas. The project was a top-scoring proposal chosen for the funding and will result in the conversion of one of the U.S. Army diesel locomotives to battery electric, according to the news release. The battery system on the Atlas locomotives are designed to provide backup power during emergency events, including cyber attacks, providing an additional layer of operational readiness. And that's what caught my eye. They're, gonna, they're getting ready to have the locomotives hacked. Okay. Ah, here's a follow-up story. Last month we talked about how the FRA shut down the uh, Blackwell Northern Gateway Railroad due to a blizzard of violations, which we went through and had a little interesting conversation about that. Well, it turns out that Oklahoma is not sitting on their hands. The STB on March 1st approved the Oklahoma Department of Transportation's request to allow the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Railroad to provide temporary rail service over the rail line owned by the state and Blackwell Industrial Authority. The S STB decision allows the Rock Island to operate freight trains for 30 days along about 37 miles of the rail line that the Blackwell Northern Gateway had operated until the short line was shut down last month due to violations of federal safety regulations. The line extends from Blackwell, Oklahoma to Wellington, Kansas, where the railroad interchange with the BNSF. Oklahoma DOT and Blackwell Industrial asked the STB for, to okay the request so that the Rock Island could serve shippers that have been without rail service since the Federal Railroad Administration's emergency order against the Blackwell Northern Gateway. In its decision, the STB said the state and the Blackwell Industrial Authority want the Rock Island to provide rail service for more than 30 days and should file the request with the board well before the 30 days expire. And just so everybody knows, a guy down in Mississippi bought a short line, and since the name Chicago Rock Island Pacific was in the public domain, he quickly went out and secured it, re-registered as a trademark, and resurrected the name. And painted a bunch of locomotives in Rock Island colors, the blue and white. <laughs> well, you know that? It's been up there for quite a while. It's been out around about three, four years now. And uh, he took over sh uh, ship and Gulf Island operations. He's built in a small short line empire. This will be his third property. Not bad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rail Vision has ordered for its artificial intelligence-driven switchyard system from a Class 1. The railroad will install and use an AI system on its locomotives for evaluation and testing different scenarios related to safety, according to Rail Vision press release. The switchyard system uses electro-optical sensors combined with AI, machine learning, and advanced drive assistance system solutions that expand the range of sight and decrease downtime, while also increasing punctuality, efficiency, and safety. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I know. <laughs> They're finding all kinds of ways to get that software in there, because you know, they don't have to pay people. Just remember that. That's it. I mean, look what happened in California. Everybody gets 20 bucks an hour now at McDonald's, so McDonald's jacks the prices up to pay for it, and now they're, oh, they cost too much. Well, what did you think was going to happen? You know, it's a scale. It goes up on one side, something happens on the other side. Oh. <laughs> Basic economics. Obviously, some of these people didn't take economics 101. Nope. Okay, here's one, a little bit of celebration. Genevieve, Genesee, and Wyoming marks 125 years in business. In 1899, the Genesee and Wyoming Railroad was formed to serve a rock salt mine in Rustoff, New York, along 14 miles of track. G&W now owns or leases more than 100 regional and short-line railroads worldwide, the majority of which are in North America. Serves 3,000 customers, employs 7,300 and and employs 7,300 people. Car loads last year totaled 1.6 million units. The company's North American operations are located in 43 states and five Canadian provinces and includes more than 13,000 miles of track. While its United Kingdom Europe operations include UK's largest rail-centric intermodal logistics franchise and leading heavy haul freight. A big portion of GNW's technology push and the reason I'm reading this article is the technology angle on this, not so much the operational. It's a long article. We'll just talk about the technology because that's what's actually helping these guys make a profit. A big portion of GNW's technological push was completed last year when the company finished implementing a new enterprise resource planning, ERP system, that replaced a system that was more than 20 years old. An ERP software system helped run the entire organization by supporting automation and processing and financing, human resources, manufacturing, supply chain, services, procurement, and others, other departments. The ERP was the company's largest ever technology investment. It will drive efficiencies. It touches every facet of our business. We are trying to work out the bugs now. However, GNW and others in the rail industry gradually have been slow to adopt technologies because of regulators. We want the regulators to be uh, consonant of that. In the meantime, GNW is pressing on with efforts to be more technology, be more of a technology adopter. For example, the company is one of the joint venture members in Rail Pulse, Rail Pulse, the coalition of car rail owners that are working to facilitate and accelerate the adoption of GPS and other telemetric technologies across North American rail car network to significantly increase visibility efficiency and safety we are the only we are the only mode that doesn't have a real-time location for every shipment that needs to be a cultural change in terms of car locations as monitored by railroads third parties and others there are three or four different versions of the truth as to the exact location that that isn't very helpful to the customers we need to have the same truth it isn't about speed for the customers, it's about reliability. Uh, GNW is also working with RailSpire on a project involving locomotive automation. RailSpire retrofits locomotives for autonomous driving capabilities to help increase productivity, improve safety, and employee retention, and reduce asset damage and costs. I, uh, yep, those are the keywords. <laughs> the company aims to bridge the gap between traditional locomotive operations and emerging technologies with human machine orchestration, uh, artificial intelligence based train handling, and logarithmic control, algorithm, algorithm control. In addition, GNW is working with parallel systems on a pilot project involving battery electric rail cars for anonymous container movements. Subsidiaries Georgia Central and Heart of Georgia Railroad. Last year, petitioned, uh, petitioned the FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, to test the zero-emission freight car technology on portions of their lines in Georgia. If the petition is approved, the multi-phase pilot project would begin this year and be overseen by the FRA, GNW, and Parallel Systems. The demonstration of the te technology in the field will involve carefully developed protocols to ensure the pilot is operated in a safe and controlled manner. GNW officials believe that the development and anticipated adoption of the technology 
has the potential to capture new container business moving to and from the port of Savannah. It would also be it could also reinvigorate traffic on rural lines, revive inland ports in Georgia, remove trucks from the regional roads, and reduce carbon emissions, they stress. So there's the automation report for the GNW. And yes, they have the they uh, run the the short line called Port of Savannah. All right, they have uh, Savannah and Old Something is the name of it. Finally, we got a new short line in the Chicago area. Name is going to sound terribly familiar. Great Lakes Basin Railroad. Great Lakes Basin Railroad to commence up that connects to the North Fork Southern Railway inside the industrial facility owned by N. Boulevard, Hammond, Indiana. It's basically a spur, probably for transload. Uh, the name sounded familiar. Under various names, there was a group to try to promote a sh build a new railroad that ran from Indiana around Chicago and up into Wisconsin as a bypass and one of the many names was Great Lakes Great Lakes Basin Transportation Railroad. Indiana had a few other names too. It went nowhere they even filed with the ST. And they looked at it and said nope. So that's what I got. Not much. They said it's been very quiet out there. Well, yeah, actually some things, nice things have been popping up uh, in the preservation world and also development. I mean, WabTech sees hydrogen as the fuel of the future. Zero emission technologies can follow short-term use as substitute for diesels. Hydrogen is they're talking about for cars. Yeah, I mean Utah's already doing it. You could buy, a, you could have a car converted to natural gas, and they have natural gas stations throughout the state that you can go fill up. So just switching to hydrogen, it would be the same learning curve as it was for gasoline. And if you look back, you know, in the twenties and thirties when we were learning how to transport, store, distribute gasoline. Instead of having it blow up all the time, we're going to go through the same learning curve with hydrogen, except people don't want to wait. So the first time when these trains derails the with the hydrogen tender in the back or hydrogen on board, and you get that small, what looks like a small nuke going off, people are going to get bent out of shape and try to get laws to ban it and, and stuff. Same with the cars. Yeah, well, considering the way the, de uh, the train's supposed to look like, I mean, they got a lot of dark windows there. <laughs> yep. Don't want to be identified. That's because it's AI. <laughs> Could be. Could be. That's why there's no windows. It looks like it has the fake windows, like those buildings they have disguised that, like the AT&T building in New York, which no nobody ever goes in and out, but that's the central switch for the whole East Coast. Yeah. But, yeah, the, you know, fuel cells and everything, they, they, they got it all figured out. So they're going to make it uh, with the fuel cell. Basic, well, that's the way well, to go. Basically, retrofitting the locomotives is what they want to do. You have fuel cells and batteries. Well, fuel, fuel cells is not that new technology. That's what's been used on the spacecrafts all this time. That's how they get their power. Yeah. You know, I understand that. You know, and then the batteries, you know, just uh, you know, figure how big a battery that you need. <laughs> Boy, that's one big energizer, buddy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Got to have our energizer, buddy. Yeah, boom, boom, boom. Hey, he took over the, you know, from the Ever Ready Cat. That's right. So what do they say about the fuel cells and the hydrogen and all that good stuff? Well, let's see. Web, well, WebTech, you know, sees it as the future. So that's what they're concentrating their effort on. And WebTech sees hydrogen as a fuel of the future, whether it's burned in an internal combustion engine or used to power fuel cells. We're not seeing this as a fringe thing. This is going to be the thing that replaces diesels, says Philip uh, Mosier, 
Wabtec's uh, corporate uh, vice president for advanced technologies. And this is falling right in with uh, California. See, I don't see them using it in, in burning it in the engine with the pistons because they tried that with the alcohol driven cars. And there was, pro- first of all, the BTU is not as strong as it is as gasoline. That's why it, now Brazil has been having, they had alcohol burning engines since 1990. This is, GM was built in them. But GM told our guys, oh, I can't do that. It doesn't work. But what uh, Brazil did was they had the leftover stuff from the sugar cane. So they made alcohol out of it. And all the cars are basically sold after, I think it was sold after two two year 2000 or 2005, are alcohol burners. But they have a one-gallon gasoline because you can't start a car with alcohol. So they start the car with gasoline. And when it warms up, it switches over to uh, alcohol burning. And the alcohol is only 29 cents a gallon. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yeah. So the building uh, straight using the straight alcohol from the sugar. Yep. So, but that lesson is when they talk about using it as a part of the in- hydrogen will never be used in an internal combustion engine. It just doesn't have the horsepower, uh, the BTUs. Using it in the... Uh, Fuel cell, however, and make it drive the electric. That's probably yeah. the way to go, because yeah. the byproduct is water. Mm-hmm. Water is easy. Well, that's it. that's it. Yeah, you know, fill it up. Yeah. Oh well, look what the Florida East Coast is doing with natural gas, where they got the natural gas tender between the two locomotives. Yeah. They could do that. They could have it on board if they put it in liquid form. They could have it on board, or they could have it as compressed gas. Now, liquid yeah. that's ice cold, that's the coldest thing you can uh, generate is hydrogen, liquid mm-hmm. hydrogen. Yeah. Um, again, it's just a matter of how you're gonna how you're gonna transfer it from one tank to another. That's handling, and that goes back to what I said. We're gonna go through a learning curve on that one. Yes, we Oops, will. It blew up. Oh well, gotta try again. Yeah. The nozzle wasn't right. Yeah, they'll take it out to Colorado, put it on the test track. And yeah, I mean, I don't want to sound dismal, but that's exactly what happened to that space shuttle when the old rings froze. Yeah, and went brittle. You know, that was a hydrogen tank, and hydrogen found a way out and ignited, and blew up the space shuttle. So that's you know, it's it the the idea is good, but this the handling. What do you do with the stuff when it's like twenty six below outside, or it's uh, one hundred and ten degrees outside, and the materials? go goofy in the onion stuff oh yeah you know because on one side it's 110 degrees it's been sitting in the sun so it's probably 150 160 and suddenly you run the ice cold hydrogen liquid through it which is around about minus you know i think it's about minus 150 something like that yeah Ooh. yeah so you ah. got material handling problem here and that's that's where the learning yeah. curve comes in same with the gasoline. That's when they found out that, ooh, gasoline deteriorates rubber. We can't use rubber ca- things. We have to use something else. So, yeah, no, good idea, but it's gonna, there's a learning curve here. Yeah. Learning curve and a handling I, curve. I mean, yeah, it is. I mean, even when you were talking about, we had, you know, we were talking about that one company that's making, wants to make uh, battery-powered boxcars. Mm-hmm. And. Yeah, rail spire. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, to send them out on their merry way. That's going to be a learning curve, whether they like it or not. I mean, I commend commend them. Hey, good idea. Let's try it. See what happens. Yeah. Well, it's like those guys. Well, they they're have they have their test tracks built now at Rock Hill Furnace mm-hmm. on the East Broadtop. What are they testing? They're testing battery-powered subway cars. Which cars? Subway. Oh, okay. To, for transit. Got third ba- rail. What do you need that for? Overhead. No, yeah, battery-powered. This way, no emission. And it's cheaper. That sounds like what they, again, I'm going to go back to Brazil. Brazil's got one of their transit lines is that way. The trolley runs on the track on battery. But when it pulls into one of its stations, it puts the pantograph up and recharges the batteries. So over the station, there's a wire so they can recharge. Then they go down. Yeah, and that, and they got that big plug in. 
They yeah. go and step and outside long the door. Cord. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's they one of their transit lines does that. Yeah. And they basically literally recharge the battery as they're running. Mm-hmm. And that that see it's been called an experiment and they're not sure if that's the way to go or not. I think so. I that's a yeah. that solves a lot of problems. Like for instance, they decide to put streetcars into downtown Chicago. You don't want wires overhead. Right. So, okay, the last station stopped before the loop, put the pantograph up, charge up the batteries, and into the loop you go. And when you come back out, you stop, recharge again while you're stopping for the people, and then off you go. Well, if you noticed, they really didn't have that many lines in the streets when you sit there and look at the system. Oh, yeah. Because we had something that San Francisco took from us. And that was the cable car. Yeah. Oh Well, yeah, you look at a lot of the, like in Mexico and south of the border, a lot of times the railroads were laid down the middle of the street, but there was down the middle, there was grass on both sides, and then there was the street. And a lot of times when the railroads were ripped out, you got these nice wide boulevards with the greenway in the middle. Mm-hmm. And those that have kept the stuff converted, Brazil's converting a lot of their old rail lines into rapid transit. Because mm-hmm. they didn't bother to, you know, I... Their laws are a little different, so it's the government owned the railroad, so you're not going to get it, not going to get the land for anything. And uh, so they're converting it all to rapid transit. Oh, darn. So it's, you can see this on the Google Maps if you watch some of the lines. Mm-hmm. You, know, you have to get an old, you have to do a Google search to get an old map of mm-hmm. the rail lines, and then you got to start looking to see where they're at now. Yeah, well, you know, I look for my railroad movies and see what country's doing what. And Which comes up, what was the name of that movie? It was set in, I think it was set in Chile in the copper mines where it shows the electric railroads running back and forth and it was a workers' revolt. I can't remember the name of that movie for anything in the world. I know which one you're talking yeah. about, too. Nice pictures of the box motors going back and forth. Oh, and, yeah, I mean, it's a really yeah. good. If Ron Small in here, he'd be drooling a little bit. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. What else you got? Well, we got Western Maryland Scenic's going to expand with a short line lease. Woohoo! Georges Creek Railway will provide passenger and freight opportunities. Uh, the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad, if you have not been there, is worth worthy of uh, riding. Uh, you have, they have a dinner train that you can do. Uh, you go between Cha- uh, Chambersburg and Frostburg, mm-hmm. and yes, you do have diesel on it because they got to pull the train back down the mountain. Because the is there equipment labeled Western Maryland? Yes, it is. You know, there's a I'm not sure which one if it's Steel Highway or Virtual Rail Fan has a camera pointed at Cumberland Station. So you can see the steam engine going in and out and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They've uh, they've got uh, they got a, a GE on it in the black scheme, and they have uh, a Jeep Thirty in the circus scheme. Oh, cool! You know what else you could do on that uh, line? They got those those pedal things that you can go up and down the track too. Yeah, in fact. Uh, there's there's a, a, a tourist line that has come into existence in the last couple of years out of Boyertown, Pennsylvania, all the way into uh, Pot, uh, Potsdam. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm actually familiar with that area. <laughs> and uh, now we're, we're talking my growing up area. The boyhood place, huh? Yeah, boyhood place, yeah. I remember this. We used to set fire to the coal towers. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Almost. But, yeah, um, they've got, uh, they started an uh, uh, actual tourist run out of there. Mm-hmm. And they um, and wanted to help make money. They're making track buggies, track okay. bikes. That's that's what I was trying to think of the name. Man. What, yeah, what the heck they call track them? Track bike. Basically, it's a, you know, 
seats four or six people and they yeah, pedal in. Yeah, four to six. You can get one, two, or three rows. <laughs> and yes, they all help in pedaling with it. And they're making not only standard gauge, they're doing also narrow gauge. Also for the EBT? Maybe. EBT. Heck, maybe even uh, the Durango Silverton for the Hardy. Hey, didn't they just get bought by somebody? Who? Uh, Denver and Silverton Railroad. Oh, I have to look that up. I just thought somebody just acquired them and something else, or somebody's going to operate, or they're going to operate something. I don't remember, but they were involved in some transaction last month. Mm. It was a good one. It wasn't anything detrimental. Yeah, okay. That's probably why I just read this and said, oh, okay, and just went on to the next article and then said, okay, oh, it's, mm. it's, there's nothing negative here as far as I'm concerned, so it's <laughs> not worth paying attention to it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, oh, I look at the stories. Oh, that's a good yeah. Okay, good. You know, it's just like, you know, if you, uh, when I'll, I'll, I'll bring in an issue like in May with the, the May issue. Mm -hmm. That's usually has cent uh, center spread, Reading and Northern Railroad. And that's with the trips that they put run on weekends going up to, uh, Jim Thorpe, mm -hmm. and then uh, they are now running into Scranton, going up the path, um, and using they are using the Reading T1, 2102. Uh, they are using their F units, and they got a uh, couple others that they're run uh, all the RDCs are running. And somehow they always end up in the parking lot at the Yingling Factory Brewery. Hmm. Yeah. It's just inside the gates. Sounds good to me. <laughs> By the way, um, don't know if you noticed, Great Railway Journeys had a special edition on Monday night. Oh, really? And they were celebrating like 20 years or some anniversary, but it was on the PBS station out of Indiana. Cable company carries here and Comcast carried on Channel 17. And they were, they were talking about some of this, the, the Malay that's running over in Maryland and, and uh, well, yeah, the uh, uh, Silverton. Well, that's the largest. The one in New Mexico the, with the guy where he painted the train. He, they brought in a graffiti artist who artistically did the locomotive and a couple of passenger cars so they could run it on their tourist uh, line out there. Mm -hmm. So that's what they, just a programming note, they, obviously they stop every so often, give me, give me, subscribe, and then they go back to the trains. Yeah. <laughs> but i seen it. i seen it. So just a programming note that anybody's watching the TV, uh, they're yeah. cycling that right now. Yeah, go ahead. It's worth it too. Yeah, in fact, they had the, uh, yeah, the pre-painted pictures of the two PAs that are saved in the museums. One's painted in the Mexican uh, color, mm -hmm. the two-tone blue, and the other's painted in daylight colors. <laughs> they convinced them to do daylight colors on the one. That's good. It's in the museum. It's preserved. That's goodness. They're both of them are. I don't really argue too much if it's got the wrong railroad on it. It's preserved. That's all that matters. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it's interesting the way the uh, two, they got, do, what Doyle went through to get that. Yeah. And that was great. His, uh, his nickel plate one <laughs> is in Scranton right now. Oh, okay. In the shop, getting the electronics in. Cool. Yeah, well, that's, that's Alco heaven there. Trust me, they have... All these hood units, all painted in the same color, and they all got their own corporate flag on them. Oh, great. When, from when they were in service. Great. So you see a flag for the Lehigh Valley. You'll see a flag for the... Uh, uh, Wabash? Nope, not the Wabash. Uh, DL&W. Lehigh Valley, about uh, yeah. Lehigh in New England. Huh? Lehigh in New England. Yeah, I Lehigh. I think what's out there, Virginia. Yeah, Lehigh, New England. Oh, yeah, the red dot. 
Yeah. And uh, between, because that, and... Uh, Central New Jersey. Fun, oh, yeah, Central New Jersey. You've got uh, Reading. Uh, or Reading for us people who are ignorant. <laughs> yeah, Ride the Reading. <laughs> Those was is on my Monopoly board. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I, um, they did a story on me setting up a train set at the uh, gun school for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And Captain loved it. He thought it was great and everything. So I said, where are you from? I said, I'm Reading, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Got the newspaper, base paper. Why did they spell it like Redding, California? R E D D I N G. Yep. I'm going, oh. Well, that's the idiosyncrasies of the English language. Well, the American version of English language. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me rephrase that. Because I don't know if there's, there's a guy, he lives up here now in Skokie. We tracked down his address. He accidentally, we figured out where he lives, but not supposed to know. And it's uh, lost in the pond. And he does, he's, he's a British guy, married to an American, lived in Indiana for a while. Now he lived in Chicago. Now he bought a house in Skokie. So he talks about, it's called Lost in the Pond because he says, I'm on a quest to discover all the memos lost between the U.S. and Britain in the pond. And he talks about the differences between the two countries. Mm-hmm. It's funny as heck because he just, just, he, it just, he makes it interesting and funny. He ended up laughing a lot. He goes, he was talking like the storms, he goes, Storms in America, Britain has nothing over us. He says, we have a storm. We have a storm. People in Britain are behind in their basements. <laughs> and he's standing in his basement doing this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Yeah, that, that stuff is good. It really is. So you got Redding, Redding, and Redding. Which one? Spell it. Okay, now I know which, which state you're talking We're about. We're after Redding, England. Yep. Yeah. That's where our city came up. But R-E-A-D by itself is read. But there's also R-E-E-D, read. So reading, is there a reading, R-E-E-D-I-N-G? I don't know. We should go look on Google and see if there is a town called that. R-E-E-D, probably, probably yeah. there is. There probably is. I mean, you got places called like Santa Claus, Metropolis, why not? You know? oh, Hell, yeah. Hell, Michigan. Yeah, truth or consequences. Yep, Wyoming. <laughs> I thought that was in New Mexico. It could be. It's out west someplace. Yeah. I thought it was Wyoming, but you know, Colorado's got a lot of weird names too. So, oh yeah, the whole west does. Between the Mississippi and Rockies, you could find a well, lot of goofy stuff. It was like well, we made signposts uh, when we were uh, do, uh, uh, lay, uh, working on the trackage, so we could start running our, uh, the trains out in Campo. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know we're talking like if you if you walk four miles one way you come to a nice tunnel, go halfway in you're in Mexico, <laughs> and it and you are setting off alarm bells. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and uh, you damn smart. We, we had you. to we had to make sure that they got the phone call that we were running trips on our, with speeders <laughs> into the middle <laughs> of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. And of course, everybody crossed the line. <laughs> oh yeah, you're not going to get anybody. Don't don't go there. Okay, and they go there. Of course. But yeah, we were and we ran back up the tracks, and so some of the places we went by, we decided to name a location. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we had the yapping dogs. <laughs> we had yapping dogs. Uh. Then the sunshine smile, mm-hmm. because it's, that's all they wore, sunshine smile. Yes, they were uh, uh, formulating their own little nudist kind of Well, you know, naming spots on the railroad. Some were real towns. Some yeah. of them were just a water tank, nothing more. That, that's it. Or it was a, a junction point where mm-hmm. there was a switch to go someplace. And they just gave it a random name sometimes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Barking dog, yeah. Yeah, you go look on a map. Where is this place? Because, you know, if you look through the steam, steam-powered video maps, you can't find some of those names. You do a Google search, and they don't appear. Or I did one. I put the name in it. It said, blah, 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 comma, Illinois. And it put me in the middle of England. 
And I'm like, no, 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 Illinois. Did you miss the, you know, I'm yelling at the screen, Illinois, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we, we were, it, it's fun. You know, it, 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 now is that the uh, that's the one that dips in and out over well, across the border a couple of times and has that big long trestle that they have the water cans along it so it doesn't burn. Oh, the, the goat trestle. Yeah. Well, that's that's where out of service, right? We yeah, it is. Um, the portion went through apparently uh, tunnels. A couple of tunnels caught fire. How's a tunnel catch fire? Wood. Oh, okay. So they framed it with wood on the inside. Okay. Yeah, the wood and uh, yeah, a couple of bricks here and there, no problem. And, Go and, 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 well, and actually, it shifts in 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 in, in Goat Canyon. It does what? It sh- the, the, the the ground oh, shifts. The, okay. Not even earthquake. <laughs> yeah, but see, Go to Menards, get a couple yeah. of bricks, you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah there you go. And then, uh, but yeah, they had the. Uh, and we've had some people that have done it not getting permission. No, oh, going over the whole line and not telling anybody? Yeah, trying. Well, you'll find out a couple of the bridges are out. Oh. Because wasn't there a plan to some guy wanted to actually reopen that whole line? Oh, yeah. Bypass for transportation? Yeah, well, what it is, it'll take you into the Imperial Valley. Ah, Okay. That and to in uh, Calexico, uh, Calexico on the U.S. side, Mexicali on <laughs> on the Mexican side, and that's where the border crossing is. Mm-hmm. And we used to we actually used to run trips out of uh, Mexicali. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a guy who owned two passenger cars that he kept up there, mm-hmm. sleepers. <laughs> And uh, we used to run trips with them, and we go down to Puerto Penasco. And it turns out the times we go down there, that's when the shrimp boats come in. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. You can get 10 pounds of shrimp. Yes. Uh, I'm medi- listening. Medium size. Now you're making me hungry. Medium size. Okay. For 10 bucks. Ooh. We're talking you pay one buck a pound. For shrimp. I go back. Does the phrase pig out mean anything to you? <laughs> <laughs> when I go back uh, from that weekend, I have 40 pounds of shrimp from the orders I got from the guys that I s- stationed with. <laughs> and, well, where's my shrimp? Where's my, where's my money? Where's my money? <laughs> You yeah. said it was a dollar pound, yeah, but there's a ten dollar charge to transport. <laughs> That's it. Oh, really? It was, it was a lot of fun. Sounds like it. And we got one uh, restaurant we always go to, and we have a lot, a lot of people. I mean, we had people coming down. I learned uh, hand signs, mm-hmm. hand language, from one of our passengers. She um uh, she rides down with uh, her niece, hmm. and uh, we got t- to talking pretty good. She does talk, you know. But this way, I I, I said, oh, if I'm going to talk to her, I'm going to I'm going to learn s- sign, and so I started to, and it was great. Hmm, sounds good. Then there's a, there's a, there is a story I'm trying to track down. I saw it on one of the videos. I don't know if it was like RM Transit or City Nerd or one of, one of those guys. Probably was, or one of the other ones that talks about passenger operations. There was a line, a passenger line that Mexican government wanted to start to the, uh, to the Yucatan Peninsula. Mm-hmm. And the railroad was resistant, so they seized the railroad so they could put the passenger line in. They actually sent the army in to take the railroad over. And I'm trying to track that story down. I, I found that fascinating. That, what do you mean you don't want to run passenger trains? See this gun? You're going to run passenger trains now. <laughs> in the new negotiations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. But, yeah. Uh, speaking of Mexico, <laughs> I brought, brought that to my mind. I got to go track that one down. 
What else you got? Ah. Oh, the uh, T1 mm -hmm. uh, that they're building, the Pensy T1. Okay. Uh, 50, uh, fi they finally hit the 50 uh, percentage mark. Oh, good. So what is that, another year till we see it, or two years or something? Something like that. Yeah. You know, uh, they're, you know what it is, trying to find the right people to, to, to you know. Sure. Machinists are in short uh, supply. Yeah, somebody fired all the good machinists. Well, not only that, but a lot of them just, you know, the number of new people going into it was far less than the people retiring out of it. Oh, yeah. Because uh, Wright College runs a machine, we train machinists over at the Humboldt Park branch, and the class is limited to 25 because it's a small room, okay? I mean, it's got all the latest stuff, you know, how to program them. Yeah. And, uh, every one of those guys who completes the program gets a job, and there's a waiting list by companies to get the next class. Not even a problem getting... See, that's each, just... Each guy gets three or four job I mean, offers. I mean, they're, 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 they're sitting there... Very successful they were program. making fun of people who do normal jobs. Mm -hmm. Plumbers. Ever watch Mike Rowe? 30 jobs? I watch it with fascination. I go, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't do that, but wow. That's all I would sit there. Wow. But, yeah, you, you had the. But you get used to it, too, though. When, yeah, but you, when, you know, everybody's saying, well, you know, no, nobody wants to do manual labor. Oh, how much do you get? We let men well, let's see. It. You got, you know, you're a welder. You can you prefabricate? Mm -hmm. Do you work different? Have different? Uh, do you work with different types? Not, you know, not like electric and stuff sure. like that. You know, do you do forms? You know, and uh, you know, you're starting out thirty five bucks an hour. Our college has the employers have discovered. That, hey, for people to do some of this IT work, don't need a degree. They just need a two-year college degree. As long as we train them in the area they want, they'll hire them. What a revelation. Yeah, so you, what what do you want? Railroads don't require it. Well, if you're going to be in the front office, you do. But, I mean, to run the locomotive, be a conductor or be a track worker or signal guy or whatever, they don't require a college degree. Nope. I think the electrician, you have to be certified to be an electrician, though. But the engineer still, as an engineer, you still had to be certified, right? You had to be car carrying yeah. or something? Oh, yeah. You get, you get a... It's like getting a CDL license, basically. Basically a CDL license, you know, regular driver's license. I have a license. I could run any locomotive now, mm -hmm. I think. Is that how it goes, or you you got to have it for a specific range? No, no. You, uh, I, I... My last l locomotive one, I had I could run three uh, types of motor power. Okay, I could do diesel. Mm -hmm. I can do electric. I mean, I was running the University Park lines, and I was running steam. Okay, so you're qualified for all three. Yep. Now, is that a, who pays for that? I mean, do you pay for that, or does the employer pay for that licensing? Licensing gets paid for by the uh, um, employer. Okay. And yeah. how often do you have to recertify, like every two years, three years, ten two years, years or something? Every two years. And is it a written and test? or? Yeah. What? You take a written rules book test. Well, I'm just asking you because I know there's people who don't know what this process is. No, no. That's that's why I'm saying, you know, yes, you go through, you you know, you got the G-Core, mm -hmm. general code of operating rules okay and we get tested on those and then you get tested also in the area where you would be running so you'd be qualified uh for me to to work the heritage corridor i had to be qualified on the trackage from joliet to Ch chicago union terminal now to qualify you have to run over at least once right Oh, more than that. More than that, okay. Now, did, were you ever a pilot for somebody else? Yes. Okay. You want to explain what a pilot does? No, pilot. not the guy in the front of the plane either. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some of, the, some of these guys think they're pilots. 
uh, depending upon the locomotive. But yes, you you uh, yeah you go through the rule book you 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 get familiar with the you in fact you'll have to carry a copy of rules for that line. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, when I was in training uh, with Metra, I got qualified. You know, they had me doing the. Uh, Joliet line. Uh, I was doing the Orland Park line. Okay. And I was doing the uh, Heritage Corridor. Okay. All three. And I stayed, when I did the uh, test, I just stayed with the uh, Heritage Corridor. And the uh, electric line. And it just involves, like, knowing where the whistle posts are, where the crossings are, street Yeah, where, where stuff is, you know. Switches. Mile kind of markers stuff. and stuff like that on some of the uh, signals, you know. And then a pilot you know, tells somebody else where all yeah. that stuff is. Like, if I come to a signal that's red, uh, okay, if I come to a stop, can I go across? On some of them, yes, you can. Yeah, absolute. I, I, Was that absolute permission or something like that? Yeah, yeah. They, uh, you, you, especially if you got a number on it, you're good to go. And now you don't have to call that one in to get to go through the red, do you? I usually do. Oh, okay. You call the dispatcher. Hey, can I go? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know that that that, that guy in the switcher that not looking at me. I don't want to get hit by him. Yeah. Or if I do, you're going to pay me a lot. Yeah, I was out in Franklin Park tra- you know, during uh, train days telling the cop, see those signals down there? You're worried about a train coming. Here's your first clue. You see a green up there. doesn't matter which one it is. You see a green, there's a train coming. It's the that track simple. is clear. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. if it's red, there's no train moving. Yeah. So. But, yeah, yeah you, you, you do. Um, now, do the conductors have to be licensed? They're trying to do that now, yes. Okay. That was that was coming in when I left. And I know some nut nut in Illinois wants to license K through twelve teachers to teach computers. <laughs> yeah, you heard me right. I I can understand licensing in some areas, okay? But there's some areas no. Should never be uh, any licensing. Yeah, uh, you're, you're. You want to be a truck driver? You should have a CD, CDL license. Yeah. Period. If you're hauling hazardous materials, yes, you need that extra licensing because of the fact of what you're hauling. Like the steel haulers, they got that special license for them. Yeah, and then they like to go around gates. Yep. <laughs> in front of Amtrak. Oh, uh, we got steel. Try hit us. Oh, wait a minute. Why is the truck mangled? <laughs> I'll never forget that one in Bourbon. Were you involved in that or no? Or no, you're... I had just parked my train. Ah, okay. At University Park. We heard this noise just down the tracks. Oh, man. Well, you know, I still watch people go around the gates. As a matter of fact, uh, when Virtual Rail Fan runs their synops, where the guy takes, you know, snaps over the last two or three days, to show you interesting things like fallen flags or or interesting. He's always got at least one or two Darwin Award ones where you got the people or the cars driving out in front of the trains. Oh, yeah. I mean. He's even had the ones where the trains hit the people. Now, that was down in LaGrange, so, you know, it's just a cruncher. And trains run about five miles an hour when it's coming down the track. and So it's not, I mean, the car is mangled, but nobody's hurt. Still. Still. There was one, and he even has it now as a separate video. Some guy drives the car. It's like 2 in the morning. He drives the car onto the tracks at the crossing, gets out of the car and runs away, and here comes the train. T-bones it. Uh, <laughs> Takes out the crossing gate, the the uh, overhead, you know, the uh, the warning stuff on the gates and everything was knocked over because the way it pushed the car. Did a lot of damage. <laughs> well... I think it's 
We had had a nice evening. Yes. Uh, about a quick one on Grayland. They're still screwing around with it. <laughs> but they're getting progress. They're starting to fill in now the fill for the bridge. Hmm. They're starting to put the rock and uh, gravel hmm. and stuff to make the fill because it's going to be between the cement so that uh, probably they're supposed to be done at the end of the month. Hmm. I'll tell you this. No way. Anyway, absolutely no way. I'm waiting for the the, the letter from the alderman saying there's hmm. been a delay. Now they're talking about June. But they're starting to fill in the uh, the – they're putting the fill in on both sides of the bridge so they can get to the point where they can put track down. And, there, and the station itself, they just finally finished the foundation for it. So it, it's going to be a while to Grayland. That whole mess is cleaned up over there. Okay, so there's a Reading also in, uh, in Michigan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I did not. Well, you saw there was a, I guess, a bunch of old train, mag train magazines, old ones. They're from 2000s, sitting on the bathroom. So I was going looking through them, and, and there was one where I, did you know there's this obscure Amtrak stations? That was the name of the article. And it was like all these weird stations. And, and believe it or not, they get like 40 or 50 people a week in and out of these stations that are in the middle of nowhere. Literally in the middle of nowhere. Yes. Which is very fascinating. All right, so you want to call it quits? Yeah, I believe it's time for us to wrap it up. Wrap Put the caboose up. away and away we go. Shoving platform. <laughs> That's it, our shoving platform. Well, I ought to shove that platform. <laughs> As our express comes into the station, we want to thank you for joining us on our journey through the wonderful world of trains. Chicago Junction is a production of the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network and can be listened to on the web at www.windycityhometown.com where you can listen to tonight's broadcast and all of our past episodes. So sample some of the other and also sample some of the other programs that are being offered. This is your announcer, Brian Blue, saying till next month when we journey to Chicago Junction. Doug says good night also. You have been listening to Chicago Junction on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on Wednesday. March the 13th, the year 2024. Chicago Junction was produced and directed by John DeVita, and our special thanks to our executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, Mr. John Chaconda. This broadcast was pre-recorded on Wednesday, March the 13th, the year 2024. Until next time, friends, please be safe and thanks for listening.